Let us pray. O Lord, may the meditations on all of our hearts and the words from my lips be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The text for today's meditation is from Romans chapter 3, particularly these words. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood, through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Amen. God is just. God is the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. What does it mean that God justifies? To answer that question, it is helpful to first understand who man is, specifically who he is before God. We hear from the scriptures that man is under the law. God's mighty, perfect, holy, living, righteous law. Man is under that word, and that law cuts no corners. God's law makes no exceptions. And we hear a statement today in the scriptures. Through the law comes knowledge of sin. That's a little offensive. To hear that God's law shows you, brings to your awareness your sin. We would rather look at the law and think it is something that we can pull off, at least in some degree, before our God. We like to make comparisons when we look at the law, thinking, well, at least I've done better than my neighbor. But for any of us caught up in that way of thinking, we would do well. To hear the Holy Word of God recorded for us in the book of James that says, whoever shall keep the whole law, and yet stumble in one point, is guilty of all. To mess up even a small portion of the law still makes one a lawbreaker. And the whole world is held accountable to this law. The whole world, every sinner, there is no distinction. The law brings knowledge of sin, and the law shows our lack of the glory of God. The devil continues to deceive us in how we look at the law. One deception is that we really can heap up a great big pile of works before God and say, God, look at me. Look at what I have done. A works righteousness that comes out of the flesh that looks at our works, looks at our hands, and says, ah, look at this. And we can make comparisons with our neighbor and get puffed up. Puffed up in our pride. Luther fought this theology in Rome, emphasizing works and a righteousness from merits over and above faith in Christ. And it's a deception that continues today because, as I just mentioned, our old Adam is a works righteous theologian. But another deception the devil uses is one to think that truth 
really is dependent on what you believe. We have the Ten Commandments. We see God's law there for our lives. But what about those who would look at that law and say, ah, well, I just don't believe in it and wave it off. What about that? I don't believe it's true. I don't believe it applies to me. This whole idea of being accountable to someone besides myself, ha! Huh! I answer to no one but me. Dear Christian, we know the response to that. That truth exists because God exists, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And his word endures forever. Whether or not we believe in that word, God's holy word stands. And it is sad, it is depressing, it is heartbreaking to see our young ones, maybe friends, loved ones from our family, look at God's holy word and disregard it because they think by not believing in it, the accountability will just go away. But such is not the case. The scriptures declare what arrogant man does not want to hear, and that is we cannot save ourselves, and God's law is that mirror, and when we look into that mirror, we can only plead the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We can only look at that mirror and repent, for God's law is that measuring stick showing just how far short we are from the glory of God of the living God. Back to the question, what does it mean that God justifies? That is God speaking righteousness upon you for the sake of his Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, apart from deeds, works of the law. We hear that in the scriptures today. Apart from the law, righteousness apart from our flesh. That term righteousness can go a couple of different directions in the Bible. There is a distinction between the righteousness of God and the righteousness of man. Consider this passage, our Lord Jesus Christ, who says this, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. That's what your Savior says. Beware your righteousness. And people practice it in order to be seen. That is the righteousness of man. That is not the righteousness of God. And the difference between the two is heaven and hell. Heaven and hell. You want to practice your own righteousness and see how you do before the living God? We know the answer to that. To rely upon the flesh is death. But the good news is there is another righteousness, an alien righteousness, a righteousness that is a part of from you and the flesh. And that is the righteousness that God gives. That is the righteousness that God speaks upon you for the sake of his son, Jesus Christ. And when we say for the sake of Christ, we are talking about his death, his resurrection, his crucifixion, and his exit from the tomb. A price for sin has to be paid, and one man cannot ransom another. Creation cannot ransom creation, but the only begotten Son of God, Jesus, pours forth his blood. He gives his life to cover you, to cover your sin, to make you righteous in the sight of his heavenly Father. That's the righteousness we need to stand before God, and that is the righteousness we have in the living Christ. We hear another word in the epistle lesson this morning. It's a big one. Perhaps the theological word of the day. Propitiation. Propitiation. Christ is a propitiation. Now that word means sacrifice, yes. But a sacrifice that absorbs God's wrath for sin. Making Jesus a divine shield over us. He takes wrath for sin that we would not. Now that word propitiation has interesting Old Testament roots. Go back to Exodus 25. Picture the ark, the ark of the covenant. On top is what is called the mercy seat where the two cherubim reside. And above the cherubim, God would promise to meet Moses. That term for mercy seat there in Exodus, that Greek term, 
is propitiation in Romans. So we see it associated with the presence of God. Exodus 25, that's one interesting occurrence. Here's another. Go to Leviticus 16. We've all heard of the Day of Atonement. On the Day of Atonement, Aaron, the high priest, was charged with sprinkling blood on the mercy seat to atone for the people. So in the Old Testament, we see the presence of God, and we see atonement associated with the mercy seat. Flash forward back to the New Testament epistle lesson. Same Greek term, now, or propitiation. But we can connect the theological dots here. To stand in the presence of God, you need atonement, and you have it on account of the mercy seat himself, which is Christ, in whom you have mercy, because his blood, not the blood of bulls, not the blood of goats, but his blood covers, his blood atones. His blood makes you whole and complete in the sight of your heavenly Father. Apart from works of the law, it is in Christ. Your deep, dark, filthy sins covered completely by his blood. What an appropriate text. What an appropriate text for Reformation Sunday. A text highlighting God and his work to save in the sending of his son, Jesus Christ. The Reformation was about reforming, correcting the church. And this wasn't done by brute force on Luther's part, but by the word. Preaching and teaching the word. The word of God that highlights this. The word of God that testifies to the salvation for the world and the work and person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And for any reformation, for any change, the heart of it all must be God's holy word, Christ crucified and risen from the dead. In education, if you're going to have a Christian school, what needs to be at the center of it? Christ and his word. That worldview needs to permeate the teaching that our young ones would know while they're learning their math, they're learning geometry, they're learning science, they're learning Latin, that they know who they are in God's sight. Sinners, yes. But sinners justified on account of Christ crucified and risen. Heartbreaking it is for people who are hurting, who are broken inside, struggling, wrestling with their sin, to be pointed to themselves to fix the problem. The Lord Jesus Christ did not come to give us more and more laws to do as if more laws would fix our problem of sin. The Lord Jesus Christ does not turn people to their own flesh when they're wrestling with the demons. But the Lord Jesus Christ points us to him, points us to his work, points us to his labor to shed blood, to paint that cross red, that we would live and live abundantly. And today he still calls, he still speaks, I am the redemption price. I am the one who has given all that you would be mine. And his church, his people, he has obtained his church. He has done it by his blood. And that church will not fall asunder. Not even hell's gates will overcome her. God is just. And God is the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Hear that. Hear his verdict of you in Christ. His verdict of you in Christ that you are forgiven, you are loved you are righteous for the sake of his son, Jesus Christ, even when your emotions and feelings tell you otherwise. When you struggle with sin, when you struggle with doubt, when you look at the mirror and you see your sin and it's staring at you, the sins of your past that haunt you, those sins that keep you up at night, your recourse in such times is not your own flesh looking within but what has God said about you? 
What does God say about you in Christ? What are the promises? What is the word? Hear that. Go to that. Go to that proclamation. God has spoken. He has told you the decree, what he thinks about you. You hear it. In Christ, the sin is put away. It is covered. As you struggle, as you deal with things, wrestling with your sins, fear not. Fear not. The problem of sin has been taken care of by this Christ, this propitiation, that divine shield taking the wrath we deserve, and we live. Look in the scriptures, and you see David, a man struggling with guilt, dealing with his sin. You see Peter denying the Lord Jesus three times before the crow of the rooster. You see Job questioning his existence before God. You see Habakkuk looking around and seeing violence and destruction and wondering what his God is doing. Dear friends, the Bible is full of people with sins, problems, struggles. But those men I just listed, Peter, Job, Habakkuk, David, these are men who, like us, learned to trust in the mercy of God, to look unto him, to rely upon him, and know all really is well because we live in his hands. He's got the church in his hands, and he sent his son to die for that church, to shed blood, that the shame and guilt would be covered, and we would have peace. What does it mean that God justifies? It means you have peace. It means you reside in God's mercy. It means you are loved, dear Christian. And as the world shakes, as the world crumbles, as the world dilapidates, the church does not. The church does not. Because Jesus does not, because your God does not fade over time. How silly is that? His promises endure, his word endures, and his promise unto you. When he says, I am just and I am the one who justifies the one who has faith in Jesus, that promise is for you. That promise means your peace today and tomorrow and even when you die. When death grips you, you know in whom you reside and who has you in his hands, who has overcome the sting of death. Your Lord Jesus Christ, your Lord Jesus Christ, in whom you live today, tomorrow, and in that eternity he has prepared for his people. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We rise for the offertory.